My name is Pat O'Scannell. Um, the long version is Patricia Maureen O'Scannell. And if you want all four names, it's Patricia Maureen Anastasia O'Scannell. <laughs> um, it turns out I have another name. I was adopted, so my original name was Moira Reynolds. But be that as it may, I had just started to tell you about coming up here um, in 1980. And since you uh, gave reference to, obviously, in our discussion beforehand, um, the women's movement. I just want to mention that I've been involved in the women's movement since long before I came up to Ashland. So that's just sort of there to tuck in your back pocket. And when I got here in 1980, it was after completing a degree in music at UC Riverside. Um, and after getting involved in music fairly young, I started uh, as a professional uh, church organist when I was 13. So I had gotten in, into early music very early, started out as a church organist and got started in my training. So by the time I was in high school, I pretty much knew uh, that medieval and Renaissance music was what I wanted to do. I was lucky enough that um, I lived in Riverside, California, and at UC Riverside there was a really strong program there called Collegium Musicum, which is there to teach people either how to be a conduit between a, a modern instrument that they already play into an early instrument, or just to teach them to learn to play early instruments. And so that's kind of where I got my start there and studied under a wonderful director, Dr. Fred Gable, who's luckily still going in great health and uh, does a lot of editions of music by um, Michael Pretorius, a famous Renaissance composer. So I kind of got a really good start out in that, so it was very lucky for me that at such a young age, and I think I was 23, when Todd Barton received my resume and audition tape that he hired me. And so, you know, in reference to the women's movement, I also want to praise Todd. He had a history of hiring women uh, um, for the Green Shows as performers, which was really wonderful. I was so honored to be hired. It was definitely the, I kind of auditioned almost just as sort of a test, a trial run. I had worked at one Shakespeare festival and this one was the pinnacle uh, within the U.S. of programs like it for music. And so I kind of thought, well, I should at least get some experience auditioning, you know. So I, I was actually surprised when I was hired. Um, and Todd was also the one who allowed me to move forward 10 years later when I was advanced into the directorial position. He was the one who really facilitated that. So a big shout out to Todd Barton, who is very much um, a... Um, equal opportunity sort of sort of guy and I loved working under him although he was really my director for only one year but so I came uh, to Ashland the first 10 years I was just absorbed in being a green show musician and doing everything that we did we made a certain number of recordings there wasn't a lot of emphasis on that at that time and we accompanied um, a group of historic dancers and we did our shows, you know, it was set in this format which you probably encountered in 2020 or 20, 2000 when you got here, which was three shows. Each one was supposed to be tied to some degree to one of the outdoor plays. Um, as time went on, the interpretation of how that was going to be meted out kind of changed, you know, over time. But when I got there, it was early music all the way. Not just early music, but it was English Renaissance music. It was very much music of the time of Shakespeare, of uh, music of Shakespeare and his contemporaries, English music. And we did the three dance forms. We did, you know, um, English country dance, we did courtly dance, su such as you might find in Italy or France. And we did the Morris dancing, you know, with the sticks and the bells and all that kind of stuff. And so we really had an opportunity, uh, which was amazing, to work with live dancers every night. That was great. Um, then, uh, 10 years go by, and we, you know, series of music directors come and go, and I have the opportunity, and I go away for a year, I establish a group called the Terra Nova Consort, which does some touring, and then I come back the following year as the music director, bringing the Terra Nova Consort into residence at the Shakespeare Festival. We were the band that provided music then for the next 17 years for the dancers and also for ourselves, because the shows you may recall before Dance Kaleidoscope arrived, uh, yeah, because they, I think, came a little bit after that, um, that um, 
lost my train of thought. How could that possibly have happened? Before Dance Kaleidoscope arrived, well, we had historic dancing only. And then when they came, it all shifted to modern dance. And the whole emphasis changed. Everything changed about what we did. The dancers were, I wouldn't say fired, because it really was a season-to-season -season job at that point. But our wonderful Judy Kennedy, our wonderful dance reconstructionist who'd been with us for so many years, she was sort of moved out of the picture. And strangely, and still to this day, you know, a, a, a subject of some wonderment on my part, uh, the Terra Nova consort was, was retained, the dancers were moved aside, and then a Martha Graham trained dance ensemble from Indianapolis, um, you know, with at the head the choreographer um, David Hochoy, who used to be one, one of Martha Graham's principal dancers. You can find a lot of footage of him uh, in those days. He was an amazing, extraordinary dancer. But he's one of the few people who, who um, can choreograph in that style um, and be an official, you know, Martha dancer, Martha Graham dancer. That so that was ten years of really um, collaborating with somebody like that, and we would go back to Indianapolis and do shows with them. But that was also during the time when the Terra Nova consort was really starting to gain its foot. We started to do things outside of Ashland. We began by collaborating with a world-class uh, musician who lived in Seattle at that time. Unfortunately, she has passed. A wonderful woman named Mar Marguerite Tindemans, who was a Dutch uh, early string player. And we collaborated with her and started co-producing concerts in Seattle. And that kind of got us started sort of envisioning our band beyond just Ashland. Um, we won a few contests and blah, blah, blah. We ended up... Um, making two, well, we made 17 albums over the period of time I'm talking about, one per year. But the last two were the ones that I explained were, uh, had a more broad release. They were picked up by Dorian, which was an audiophile label um, that went under eventually, but it was a Canadian label at that time of very high standing if you were an audiophile. And it was all about the sound being perfect and, you know, the way they had us. Uh, we recorded our two albums with them. Uh, in Troy, New York, on the, in the Troy Music Hall, which is like Carnegie Hall, only better, better acoustics. And so back in the day, if you looked at your record albums, many, 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 many albums were record, recorded in Troy Music Hall. So that was, that was really cool. It was haunted. <laughs> There's stories of hauntings. But anyway, so that, um, that was that period. Was, um, for me, the Terra Nova concert was sort of my brainchild. And so everything that happened during that era was the result of a lot of, you know, con kind of concentrated effort and energy um, to produce the group and have it move beyond Ashland. So eventually we were picked up by Abbey Music Management and we started touring worldwide. We hit some um, big music festivals and we got some amazing reviews and it was just a real pinnacle for us of, of every, all of that. Unfortunately, all of that was happening at the same time that the Shakespeare Festival's interest in things historical was waning. And so there, what had been incredible support for us and everything we'd done up to that point just dropped out. And it became more about, you know, their current thing, which was David Hochoy and modern dance and, and all of that. And so it was, I have to admit, it was a little bit of a stretch for me to try to fit within all of that, to try to still have the early music component be something important and visceral and happening right now and exciting. Um, in a context of, well, what we really want is brand new music written for modern dancers. So I would consider that to be sort of a, a time when the Terra Nova consort, such as we were, um, that started to wane. And, you know, as, as life is, you know, you hit a pinnacle, you can't just be there the rest of your life. You have, things have to go up and down. So that was the contour of that. Um, after I left Shakespeare, and that was in 2007 was my last season there when I was on full contract, um, I took a few years off. I did um, my Edith Piaf show, uh, which hopefully you can maybe take a look at the review of that. And um, that had started out as a green show, but I turned it into a bit more of a um, cabaret sort of style show and, and did it at uh, a local theater, the Camelot. Um, 
and projects like that, you know, did a little bit of jazz with um, Bill Leonard and, you know, a few other people and just kind of and started a rock band <laughs> called Cover Art that did um, progressive rock. I needed to get away from early music a little bit just to kind of freshen the palette, I guess you'd say. And then in 2000, so that was 2007, then in 2016, I decided it took me a while to figure out what I was going to do, but I realized what I needed to do with early music was to start a nonprofit, that it wasn't a for-profit endeavor, and it had never been. Um, really, it always had been under the auspices of a Shakespeare festival or uh, California pleasure fairs or whatever. Um, and that on my own, it was kind of hard to figure out how to make all that work. But started Musica Matrix, which is my nonprofit, which is in suspended animation right now because of COVID-19, trying to figure out how maybe to retool it. But that's a whole other story. I started that in 2016, just started producing concerts, founded uh, probably about 10 different ensembles that I either play in or direct, and then provided, um, you know, a production support, all kinds of support for people who wanted opportunities to play uh, and provide them with an audience and all that kind of stuff. So I have a board and everything, but, you know, it's, one of, it's a small... Uh, Nonprofit. I tend to be sort of chief cook and bottle washer. Um, it keeps me very busy. But of course, you know, COVID-19 has, has changed a lot of that, so I'm in a resting period, and hence gardening <laughs> and all kinds of other things. I've completed a book. I've started on the second book. So, but getting back to, I, I, I know the crux of all of this is really the women's movement, so I want to just kind of go back in history a minute to say that I, I said early on that when I got here I was already involved in the women's movement. Um, I would say I've been a feminist since word go. I don't think, I, I probably was a feminist before I really knew what that word meant and then I read about it and went, oh, that's what I am. Um, so in that spirit, I was also a songwriter and a lot of my songs um, were about women's lives. Um, and I wrote over 50 songs. So when I first came up here, uh, the women's community, such as it was at that time, they, they saw me, they knew I worked at the Shakespeare Festival, but they more related to me through my songwriting and being a singer-songwriter. So that, that's a whole other facet of what I did. And it started to kind of, in a way, if you look just at that, it sort of disappeared, I guess, as my job at Shakespeare got bigger and bigger, and as Terra Nova became more all-consuming and everything, and also as I was able to express myself more through Terra Nova as a director, because when you direct early music, a lot of the skills are also um, arranging music, and I discovered that that was a real passion, that arranging music was something I really loved and got more into and was able to kind of flesh that out more with the Terra Nova Consort. So I guess, you know, kind of creatively that was sort of disappearing. This other thing was happening, but I continued writing songs. Um, I, I've written songs in various styles over the years since that time. Because um, another style of music that I do, and I'll shut up in just one second, is a traditional Irish music of the British Isles and Ireland, but particularly of Ireland. 87, just by the way, was the year that I, um, I went to Ireland for the very first time and was able to um, kind of connect with roots and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was, I, I remember that period being very vibrant as far as the women's community. I, I don't know what, I don't, if, I don't know if I got less in touch with it over time or if it just felt like there was a period when it was like scary to say you were a feminist. You know, maybe it was a little of both. Um, it went from a kind of a point of pride and a, and, a, and a point of something that really brought people together and various things that we did like take back the night marches and, and things like that, you know, that felt so important and, and so in the moment. And then it just, just drifted. And part of it was, like I said, it was probably me because I was pulling away from the community, not because I wanted to, but because my job was taking up more and more of my time. Like any job, you know, well, not like any job, but maybe like being a teacher or something like that where you think, okay, it's a full-time job and you work Monday through Friday, but then there's all the work you do after the fact. And what I was trying to do was to push our group and kick our butt into a, into a world-class status. And there was a lot involved with doing that, you know, uh, entering contests and, you know, playing many different places, trying to find good representation. 
God, we went through like five different agents before we found one who would actually do anything for us. And then, of course, every time you get with a different agency, it takes approximately two to three years to extricate yourself, even if they've done nothing for you. Ah, a lot of that. Um, so, but as far as the women's movement, um, yeah, I mean, I remember going up to Lake of the Woods. I remember there were, we had some gatherings up there. I know I played up there. Uh, one of my main venues uh, was a place called The Beanery, which used to be, and now this is really going back, in um, what is the place where they make the cakes and pies. It was an Italian, it was a Italian restaurant for a while and everything, but that little place where they actually make the bakery, that was the beanery. Not even that part off to the side that goes around the corner. Just that one little small room. Not the building they bought, they built next door, which became the beanery, which would have been nice to work there. It was big. This was very small. And uh, we would have live music sometimes and I would play there at night. And so I built up a little, you know, following, mostly women. And um, I think I played there once a week or something like that. I also worked at the beanery uh, for one season because when I first started working at Shakespeare, um, we were paid on kind of a, like a scholarship sort of basis. So A, it wasn't a lot of money. B, it was a shorter season than eventually it was, my season was nine months long. It was originally four months long. Um, and so you couldn't accrue more than three years worth of those kind of salaries, monies, uh, according to the federal government. Um, you had to take a break from it and start again. So I worked for three years, then I took a year off. Moved to Gold Hill, continued writing songs, with the knowledge I was going to be back the following year. They'd already told me at Shakespeare I was rehired, but I just had to leave for one year. And so, um, you know, so when, so it was the, it was really the, the federal monies aspect that caused me to have to go away. But I went away, came back. Um, and that was all around that same period. It comes down to two different aspects. The first one was the timbres of the instruments, right? So I already, my folks, my mother was a trained singer, and so I heard a lot of different styles of music at home. I'd already heard orchestral music, and I'd heard a lot of different kinds of music, but these instruments sounded different. Like there was sort of something that was called a violin, but it didn't sound like the violins I had ever heard. There was a sort of fluty thing called the recorder. Well, it had this pure sound that was different than the flute. And then there were reed instruments I'd never heard of, like, you know, capped reed instruments like crumb horns and things like that. Who, heard, who has heard of that, right? So it just kind of captured my, my imagination, the timbres. And the second part was the modes. Because the scales that we have now in modern times um, are fairly simplistic. There's like you have a major scale, you have a minor scale. You can have an augmented chord, you can have a diminished chord. But they didn't think in terms of chords. They thought in terms of modes. So instead of like two scales, they had like 12 modes. You know, and as a keyboard player, it was easier, easy for me to envision it because it really goes white key to white key, white key to white key, white key to white key. And then all of the, where the half steps are gets jumbled around for each scale producing some very exotic sounding scales. And these, were, these are the basic building blocks of, mu of Western music. This is what all of our music is based on. It got simpler and, and the rhythms, oh my gosh, the rhythms, so complex, so many different levels of rhythm going on that the notational systems had to actually be, you know, had to be created to support that many different kinds of rhythms. And all of that got simplified over time as well. So, um, sorry, I keep somehow, how do I do it? I don't know. How does she do it? So the modes were a big, huge part of it. Um, and like I said, starting out on the organ, I was able to quickly sort of figure out that I loved the early stuff. And my teacher was willing to go along with me. He got me into Buxtehude and Bach and, you know, some of the early composers and didn't insist I played all the, like there's a lot of, you may not know this or you may know this, there's a whole bunch of uh, romantic style, romantic period music written for the organ. Like tons of it. Um, don't like it. <laughs> um, it's not, it's just not my thing. So he was very, um, he was good for me because he, he taught me what I needed to know but he also allowed me to kind of find my little pocket of interest.
So that's probably what started it out. As soon as I got interested in it and I started to uh, collaborate with the Collegia Musicum program that I told you about, and that was while I was still in high school, I had a buddy who also went into early music professionally, as it happens, and we would walk over from the high school to the university campus and we'd sit outside the Collegia Musicum door and we'd, we'd listen to that. Um, and so, and now I've lost my train of, you had a question and I've yeah. rambled. And so that's when I first really heard them live. Um, and so then you start to see what they look like and you start to connect with the people playing them. You find out a little bit of information. And then when we actually began playing with the group, of course, we learned a lot more about them. We found that these instruments are, there's more people playing them now than there were in the Renaissance period. We found that there's more builders of the recorder now in the world than there were in the whole Renaissance period. So it's, it's kind of like the Highland bagpipes. There's more playing those now than ever were at the height of the instrument in Scotland when it first, you know, kind of hit its heyday. So um, you find out about them and you have an opportunity to handle them, to play. Now, this was why UC Riverside was such a great program for me because I came there and they had all these instruments. You know, they had a set of Renaissance style recorders. They had a set of crumb horns. They had a set of violas da gamba, an instrument that I still play and teach. Um, you know, they had everything. They really had, Fred Gable had taken years because the program had been going for 25 years or something before I got there and Fred had inherited and it had really burgeoned and turned it into something and had I obviously had some kind of budget to buy instruments so that was where I got the, sort of the hands-on learning about these instruments and realized that you know you could if you got a list of the good builders and stuff you could easily order instruments and, and have them made for you and the first instrument that I had uh, made that my father actually um, commissioned for me and I still have this instrument was a viola da gamba built by a man named Lynn Elder and his great con contribution to early music and it was a great he's still alive I think but he doesn't live on the west coast anymore a great contribution was he made instruments that students could afford to buy So this is the viola da gamba it's literally the vial of the legs there were a lot of other violas viola de braccio, you know, all kinds of different. It was a generic term, but it's held between the legs like a cello would be, but it comes in different sizes like all the instruments. You know, you've seen the recorder and there's a little one, a soprano, an alto, a tenor, a bass, etc. Same with these. Same with the sackbut, which is the trombone, all different sizes. Same with all the reed instruments. So this is the treble, the smallest one, and um, it's held between the legs but bowed underhand. So if you play a modern string or you've seen somebody playing violin or cello, they'd be holding this with this grip. I'm holding with this grip. The strings are made out of gut. It has frets on it like a guitar. So in pretty much every way it's totally different from a cello, but when people see it they think cello. Um, one, day, one night I played a show out on the green uh, at OSF. I was playing my tenor and at the end of the show this woman came up to me and she said oh how nice darling she said you play a training cello <laughs> so I had to explain to her no this is not a training cello in fact it's not related to the cello it's related to the guitar <laughs> but anyway just an example I think the instruments are beautiful you know they they spent a lot of time making them look beautiful because that was important to them they would hide any bits of metal they thought were unseemly or whatever so they're just a joy to look at as well but I have a very large collection of various instruments and this is one of my violas da gamba. Uh, Musica Matrix has really been my focus for the last several years uh, I wouldn't say ten but you know six maybe and I've really uh, been enjoying it I think we've brought a lot to the community however given that we were a performance-based operation basically producing concerts so that uh, musicians who play those styles would have an opportunity to play um, that's kind of hard right now uh, with what's going on with COVID-19. I'm, I'm reticent to um, produce concerts where I'm not sure people are going to come. They're not the kind of instruments that play well outside unless you're choosing specifically a loud instrument that is 
to be played outside, but most of the instruments we're dealing with and that I'm dealing with are these indoor instruments, very quiet. So I'm guessing it's probably going to be the end of this year before I can even decide on whether we will produce concerts in 2021. That's my current kind of plan is I'll make that decision in December. However, what you know, one thing that's you hate to talk about COVID-19 having any good aspects because it's just so horrific for so many people. But I guess everything, every cloud has some kind of silver lining. And what it has afforded me is just some time to kind of realize how much of what a workload I had placed upon myself and that I needed some time off. And also to think about maybe how Musica Matrix could possibly be retooled in the next couple of years in a way that would benefit the community. I'm still thinking about that. I need to talk to our web designer. I have ideas right now about how we might give some forums on our website. We have a nice website um, to local musicians to maybe post ads or talk about things they're doing. Or an idea that I had that I need to figure out if this is even feasible would be to show some concerts, some live concerts that people are doing now and produce those concerts for them so they get quite an audience. And uh, so I need to talk to the web designer to see how that could possibly work. But it took me probably, I mean, March 17th was for me because of working at the food bank. That was our cutoff date before we revamped our whole system there. That's how long it took me to be able to figure it out. I was like, I would like to think of a, a way to retool this. And I, I just kept thinking and nothing came to me. And I just set it aside. And in the setting aside of it, my, my mind was still working on it and I came up with some ideas. So I guess that's just a way to say, hey, there's always some good thing that can come out of some bad thing. And, um, and I'm just so thrilled, you know, I guess the cap on this would be to say how thrilled I am that, that a project like this is being undertaken. I think so often the contributions of women are lost and forgotten, no matter how import important you are. It can be easy to take that on and to think, oh my gosh, I'm just not whatever enough. Then you're thinking, but wait a minute, Madame Curie and you know all these famous women who you still have to kind of kick people in the butt to remind them that they existed and what they did. And um, there's more and more women like that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that that's going to burgeon and continue to bring us, uh, you know, more opportunities. Thank you.